Hi everybody. This is the video for review for test number one. Okay, so you have finished the first six lessons, which cover the first two chapters, uh, lessons one through six, I'm uh, sorry, what, uh, lessons one through four um, are from chapter one and lessons five and six are from chapter two in Math 100. And so uh, hopefully this video will um, get you ready for uh, test number one by reviewing uh, the, all the problems, not all the 25 problems on practice test one. Okay, so you will find practice test one, just the, the questions, uh, 25 questions, uh, under your module for test number one. So if you look at your Canvas shell, you should have all six lessons first, you know, after the introductory uh, module. Uh, for each lesson, you have a module. And then after the lesson six module, you will see the test number one module. And under that, uh, you will find the item, uh, practice test one. And then you'll also find the item called practice test one solution or answer key. Uh, that's a written answer key. So in addition to that, I am providing this video to go over those 25 questions, uh, maybe rather quickly uh, in, uh, as a supplement to those uh, written answer, uh, answers that you find in the answer key. All right, so hopefully this will get you um, perfectly ready for your test number one. And so let's get started. I will be sharing the uh, screen so you can see the questions on practice test one. All right, so this is practice test number one covering chapters one and two. Right, and you should, the first thing you should do is to go to your module for test number two, uh, test number one, and copy this and print this. Uh, you'll have two pages filled with questions, 25 questions, which are kind of similar to what I will be asking you on your exam, okay? All right, so the first question has to do with um, uh, truth, the truth values of um, various statements or propositions or a combination of propositions. Okay, so you know that you have, you are given P is true and Q is false, right? And then uh, the following st statements, true or false. Um, as I said before, make sure that you uh, also see the answer key for test number, the practice test one, this, this document, because I have uh, more uh, details uh, written uh, on why the answers are what they are. All right, so you have two statements, P and Q, or two propositions, P and Q. As you know, there are four cases here, uh, depending on the truth value of each. You can have true, 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 false, false, true, or false, false, okay? Those are the only four conditions. Right? And if you remember, um, the and statement, that is like this. Remember when the and statement is true? Yeah, when both statements are true. So true, and then everything else, it's gonna be false. Now we did not do a lot of um, uh, truth value or truth table discussions. But uh, this is, you know, this is what I'm constructing is called the truth table. And uh, this will tell you exactly when combinations of uh, two propositions um, are true or false. The or statement is called the disjunction. That's the second part of this question. Is true if at least one of them is true. I, I mean, it's clear when you say something or something, you know, blue or purple then if something's blue, yeah, it's okay. If it's, it's purple, that's okay, right? If both are blue, uh, I mean, if they're both blue and purple, that's okay. Uh, the only time the or statement is not true is if both F, uh, P and Q are false, right? And then um, this is a tricky one. The last two are tricky ones. Uh, if P then Q, that conditional statement, remember the question was like, when would I be lying? You know, if I say, if I live in California, I live in the United States. When is that statement a lie? Uh, if somebody lives in California and US, that's still true. If somebody does not live in California, but US, yes, those people do exist, that's true. If somebody does not live in California and does not live in US, that's okay, right? Because there are people in foreign countries. The only time when if P then Q, or if I live in California, then I live in the United States, could be false is if you find one, at least one person, a counterexample who lives in California, but not in the United States, okay? If that is, if that such an, an example is found, then the statement will be false. So that is the, um, the, the, these are the truth 
values for if p then q. And the last question here, q implies p, if q then p, this goes backwards, right? Remember, a conditional statement is false only if the first part, the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, okay? So if we go tf, then that statement will be false. So over here, you have to kind of reverse that. Q implies P. If Q, then P. So this will be false only if the first one, Q, is true and P is false. So this will be the only F here. Everything else will be a T. So like I said, we didn't do a lot uh, with the truth tables. But this is what you should, um, you know, what you should know, or you should just remember that uh, a conditional is tr is is basically true, uh, except in one case when the first part is true and the second part is false. So according to the uh, table here, p and q, right? What did I say about the truth values of these? P is true and q is false. So remember, an and statement requires both to be true. So this will be false. Okay, P or Q uh, or statement or disjunction, uh, that's this one here, uh, is almost always true, okay? Except the only time it's false is if both are false and that's not the case here because P is true. So if P is true, at least one of them is true and therefore this is true. Okay, if P then Q, uh, I'm saying this is true and this is false. That's exactly the case where this is false, right? That's right here uh, because P is true and Q is false. But if you reverse that arrow, if Q then P, then, uh, then um, this line, see, uh, maybe I should highlight this. This thing here is saying uh, P is true and Q is false. That's this line. So if you look at this line, the answer, uh, part A is false, the part B is true, part C is false, and part D of this problem, uh, it turns out to be true. And that's because uh, you're told, you're, you're told Q is false. I, if you start from the false statement, then you can basically prove anything right? and prove every, every, anything. So if Q then P, that statement will be a true statement if Q is false and P is true. The reversal, if P then Q, that would be false. But if Q then P, would be a statement that is true under these circumstances. All right, so you can read more about this in the text or in the answer key that is also found in the same module. Number two, give an example of each type of fallacy here. Uh, appeal to authority, appeal, uh, correlation, causation, false dilemma. I'll let you look at this. Right? Uh, I'm not going to write down all the details here, but for instance, uh, on the answer key, you will see appeal to authority like, um, global warming is going to destroy the earth in 10 years because that's what my science teacher told me. Okay, so try to find an authority. Okay. Oh, I, I found a, a recent Facebook post. You know, if some, somebody told me, oh, I have a, a friend who is a nurse and she said that wearing masks doesn't help anybody. Um, so let's not wear a mask. Okay, that's not feeling to an authority because one nurse is sort of an authority on health uh, healthcare, right? Uh, but just because one nurse said something does not mean it's true. Now, it doesn't mean it's false, okay? Uh, or even one doctor. Let's say, if, you know, if a doctor says, um, you know, uh, I'll try this medicine. This is uh, perfect. Uh, this provides a perfect vaccination against the coronavirus. One doctor, okay? Now, that one doctor is an authority. But if that person um, is saying something contrary to a whole bunch of other authorities, then that doesn't, you know, uh, make it true. So that's an appeal to authority. Correlation causation, the, the answer I gave you in the answer key is uh, that French speaking people um, live longer than English speaking people and therefore speaking French makes you longer, live longer. Uh, of course, that's a ridiculous statement, okay? But it is true that uh, if you look at the people who speak French, uh, overall, over, all over the world, uh, they seem to live longer than the ones who speak English, okay? But that does not mean that the language they speak is the cause of the, um, their long life. So the correlation does not uh, refer to or um, imply causation. There are lots of them. Um, you know, people, the kids who play music seem to do better in school, definitely correlation there, but it doesn't make it, doesn't make it true. 
necessarily true that um, playing music will make a, a person smarter. Usually there are like underlying, you know, common underlying cause. It's not one is the cause of the other. Right? A classic example of that one is, you know, hey, look, uh, if you look at the people who are very wealthy, many of them will own private jets. Okay, so there's definitely a correlation between ownership of private jets and being rich. And therefore, uh, owning a uh, jet, a private jet, will cause you to be rich. No, 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 that's not the case. All right, and then part C, false dilemma. You have a um, statement in the answer key that says, since you don't drink wine, you must like beer. That's a limited choice, right? Uh, you're assuming that everybody either likes wine or beer. Oh, you don't drink wine, so you must be beer drinker. You know, of course, some people don't drink either. So that would be an example of a false dilemma. All right, number three, uh, write the negation of the statement. Some people like it hot, okay? And I don't know what that means, you know, what the it is, but it doesn't matter, okay? This one, if you analyze this, some, this is an existential quantifier, right? This is really logically saying some people, uh, there are, there exist some people, and in, in fact, there exists at least one person, that's uh, logically speaking, there exists at least one person who likes it hot. Right. So what's the negation of there is at least one person? Right. The negation is a universal statement and it's a universal negative. No one or nobody likes it hot. And again, this part doesn't make sense uh, necessarily. I don't know what that means, okay. but that doesn't matter. If you say some people like it hot, the negation of that statement is no one does. Okay. No one likes it hot. What is the negation of a statement? Every car has seat belts. All right, so this is a universal statement. And in order to negate a universal statement, uh, it's going to be an existential statement. If you are saying every car is something, the negation will say, um, not, you can't say no car. Okay? Because what you have to say is to come up with a, a, the negation, which is going to be always false, regardless of whether this statement is true or not. Okay, every car has seat belts. The uh, correct negation is, uh, remember it's gonna be an existential statement, some, okay? There exists at least one, right? So some cars, you gotta be careful here. Uh, if this is an affirmative uh, sentence, the uh, negation would be uh, existential negation. So some cars do not. Okay, so if somebody is claiming, and, and again, logically think about this. If somebody is saying, hey, look, every car has seat belts, and then you are being, you know, uh, sort of devil's advocate. Really? Like every single car in the whole world? Like you, every single car in the whole, in, in the entire universe has seat belts? I bet it's wrong. So what do you have to prove uh, that? How do you prove that statement wrong, right? And the answer is just find one car. All you need is one counterexample, right? So that's why the answer is some cars do not have seat belts. You could make it more precise by saying there exists at least one car that does not have seat belts. Okay, number five. Uh, what is the negation of the statement? I like both dogs and cats. Be sure you to, to use the word or in your answer. And that's because of the De Morgan's law thing. Okay. Remember, I like both dogs and cats, right? So you have dog lovers and cats lovers. And so uh, when you say I like both dogs and cats, this is where you are. And so the negation is everything outside of this, okay? Everything outside, how would you describe this? Uh, well, the answer is going to be, um, it's a little tricky, okay? Here, let me explain what what I'm trying to say. Um, you're saying you are both dog lover and a cat lover, okay? And the negation of this, if you remember this by De Morgan's law, named after Augustus De Morgan, uh, the negation of D or the negation of C. Logically speaking, it's easy to write this. Now let's translate this. This is saying, well, see, this is not exactly true. So what you wanna say is it's not true that I like both dogs and cats. So think about what's equivalent to this. It may be kind of difficult, um, but what you're really saying, it's not true that I love both dogs and cats. May maybe I like dogs, but not cats. Maybe I like cats, but not dogs. Maybe I don't like either of them. 
Okay, and so that's a statement you just made here. Let's translate this into English, right? So this is saying um, either I'm not a dog lover, either I don't like dogs, or I don't like cats. And of course, when you use the or statement, you know, this assumes that uh, it, it's possible that both are true. You know, I don't like dogs and I don't like cats, that's okay. Um, so that would be the correct statement. Either I don't like dogs or I don't like cats, okay? And so the word or will be there because the negation of an and statement will be an or statement, okay? All right, how about the negation of this one? If you are a student, you have to have an ID card. So this is a statement, if P then Q, and then you are negating it. Right. Do you remember the negation of if P then Q? That would be that one counter example, which is P is true, but mm, Q is not true. Uh, I think we use the example, if they build it. Uh, no, if we build it, they will come. Okay, famous quote from a wonderful movie, Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. Uh, when would that be? wrong or false, okay? You built it and they don't come. Remember the negation of, uh, let me uh, emphasize this again, over and over again, because uh, you, uh, many students get this wrong. The negation of an if statement will not have the word if, okay? Uh, the uh, statement here is, if you're a student, then you will have an ID card. The negation will not start with the word if. In fact, the word if should not appear anywhere in the negation, right? So the statement is, you are a student and remember this and the word and has to be there and you have you do not have an id card now all these answers are written much uh, uh, much more clearly in the answer key. So that's why I'm asking you to check the answer. It's, it's typewritten for one thing, not handwritten, okay? But I am not, uh, you know, the, the, the point of this video is so you can see that uh, you can hear me uh, as I talk about these uh, answers, okay? So again, the negation of an if then statement will not have the word if, but it must have the word and, okay? And think about it, this is an opposite of what you said. If, if somebody says, if you're a student, you have to have an ID card. Okay. The opposite is uh, you are a student and you don't have to have an ID card. I guess you should say you have to have, you don't have to have an ID card. That would be the negation. Okay, write the converse, inverse, and the contrapositive of the statement. If I go home, I'll sleep. Okay, now if I go home, I'm so tired. If I go home, I'm gonna sleep. The converse is if you switch the order, but don't mess with the word if and then, all right? You have to start, you still have to start the um, conditional with the word if. If I sleep, then I go home. The point is, um, it's like, well, if I sleep, that means I have gone home, okay? So, you know, because it's, you're saying, if I go home, I'm, you know, I'm, I bet I'm going to sleep. If I go home, I'll sleep. So the converse is, if I sleep, then I must have gone home. Uh, and you can write that as well. Uh, there are some um, versions, different versions of the statement. Inverse is if you negate both, but not switch the order. So if I don't go home, then negate the second part, I will not sleep. And then the contrapositive is if you do both. In other words, you, you switch and you negate. So if I don't sleep, you can also say if I will not sleep, then I don't go home or I didn't go home. Okay, so think in terms of, you know, what you do to the statement, uh, what you do to P and Q. If you switch P and Q, you get the converse. If you negate P and Q, you get the inverse. If you do both, and then you get the contrapositive. Okay, and only the contrapositive is logically equivalent to the uh, conditional statement if p then q. All right. Uh, of course, that part is not um, a part of the question. Okay, number eight. Let p be the proposition. I live in Malibu. That sounds good. And q the statement. I like surfing. Write in English the statement. Um, 
P and the negation of Q. So that would be saying I live in Malibu. All right, now remember this actually does represent an English word, a very important English word, logically speaking. So you have to have the word and in your answer, okay? Because that's a, a, a conjunction that you are making. If, so, so not if, there's no if in there. I live in Malibu and the negation of Q. I don't like surfing. And there are people like that, okay? But the, whether there are people like that does not matter for this. That's a translation of this sentence. I live in Malibu and I do not like surfing. Okay, number nine, explain the difference between inductive and deductive reasoning. Uh, you can read about this in the answer key. In the um, inductive reasoning, you basically go from specific cases to conclude something generally. Okay, so an example is, you know, I saw a bird fly yesterday, I saw another bird fly yesterday, I saw another bird fly today, a whole bunch of birds fly and therefore birds fly. In fact, maybe all birds fly. Uh, you went to from specific cases to make a general conclusion, which in this case is of course false, uh, but that's an inductive reasoning example. Deductive is to go the opposite you are given or you assume a general statement and then you apply that to a specific uh, situation. And this really is the mathematical type of um, reasoning, okay? So you have general, general statements like theorem or you know, postulate or axiom or definition or something, you know? So it says, uh, for instance, um, all triangles have uh, three angles. Right? And then specifically you found one triangle and your conclusion is since this is a triangle and all triangles must have three angles, this particular triangle should have, a three, uh, should have three angles. And another example, general statement, um, everyone must stop at red light, okay? A specific example, I am at the red light and therefore I need to stop. Okay, that would be a deductive, um, an example of a deductive reason. Okay, number 10, analyze the argument. Um, is this valid? Okay, now he, he, let me ex explain something very clearly. If the question says analyzing the, analyze the argument, is that valid? Your answer must have two things, must have either the word valid or invalid. Okay, it has to be clearly written somewhere in your answer, the word valid or invalid. The second thing you need is a Venn diagram because all these questions here that you learned in chapter one about validity has to do with what? Two uh, circles, right? One inside of the other, one is a subset of the other, okay? And then you have to explain why or why not. Use the Venn diagram, all right? Every American has a social security number. I am not American, therefore I don't have a social security number, well, okay? It sounds logical, but let's, let's figure this out. Uh, when, this is really saying, by the way, every, statement that says starts with every or each okay uh, that is a statement um, that can be converted to an if then statement this is basically saying this if you're an american then you have a social security number um, you have people who are americans and then people who have social security number and it's in this order the uh, american circle is the inside circle because if you what you're saying is if you are here then you are in the outer circle of those people who have social security numbers. Notice that you can have, possibly have a social security number without living in America or without being American, okay? And that happens to be true in real life too, right? uh, it, By the way, it is, okay? Because um, there are people of foreign uh, nationalities who have a social security number. And so uh, that's the case, all right? That this is the situation, this is the picture. Now, I am not American. Where does this statement put you? Okay, it, this, it, all it tells you is that you are outside of this in, in inner circle. So you could be here or you could be here, I question mark, right? The only uh, conclusion you can make about not being American is that you are outside of this inner circle. And therefore, you don't know if you are outside or inside of the SSM circle. So therefore, I don't have a social security number. You know, you can't assume you are here because it's possible you are still here. So the answer here, remember you have to have either one of these two words, valid or invalid. 
The answer is invalid. Okay, you can't make this conclusion based on the uh, statement. Uh, this is an example of deductive argument, of course. Um, sometimes it's called a syllogism. And so this statement is not a valid uh, statement because um, just because you're not American does not mean that you don't have a social security number based on the first statement. Okay, how about the second one? Is this a valid argument? Every cat has a comb. Now, so what? Okay, again, I just want to uh, make a point here. It doesn't matter what the statement is saying. Okay, you could say every cat has a uh, has a uh, proof for. Okay, what is a proof for? I don't know. Okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's the important part. An important part. Important part. Okay, of uh, analyzing arguments. You don't need to know what the statement says. Every cat has a comb. That means if you are a cat, you have a comb, okay? Forget the fact where it, whether it's true or not. Even forget the fact that it, you know, if it, does, it doesn't make sense. Okay, now it says you don't have a comb, right? So where are the people who don't have a comb? It's outside of this outside circle, okay? That's you here, okay? So is it possible that you can be a cat? No, because you're outside of the outer circle. If you are outside of the outer circle, there's no way you can be inside of the inner circle. So this is a valid condition, uh, uh, conclusion based on the structure of the uh, argument. Uh, now you could ask, is this sound? You know, soundness, sound means it's both valid and it's true. Now, of course, every cat doesn't have a comb, right? Uh, you probably have a cat, uh, if you have a cat, the chances are your cat does not have a comb. Maybe it does, okay, but it's just not true. The first statement is not true. So this is a, a, not a sound argument but it is very valid. Uh, it is absolutely valid uh, as an argument because of what the Venn diagram is showing. All right, uh, you could take a break if you like. Uh, you can pause your video at any time. I will just go on. The judge opposes a travel ban on from Italy. Okay, the judge, oh, judge opposes a travel ban from Italy. Does the judge welcome travelers from Italy? Okay, so again, uh, you can see the word ban, that's uh, sort of a negative, has a negative connotation. Oppose is, of course, a negative. So you have a double negative. And so the answer is yes, it does. Uh, this judge does welcome uh, people from Italy. Or you can think in this way. Ban from Italy means, you know, you're not welcoming people, right? Uh, if you have a ban from Italy, you are not welcoming people from Italy. If you oppose that, then you are saying, no, 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 you can come in. So you are... Um, allowing these people to come in. And so, yes, um, this judge tends to welcome the uh, people from Italy. Number 13, you bought a new backpack for $42, which is 60% off of the regular price. I'm going into chapter two now, or uh, yeah. Um, what was the regular price? All right. One thing you will not do is, I, I'm sure I wrote this, um, in the, uh, maybe I didn't, uh, you should, uh, you know, one thing you should not do, you do not calculate, what do you think I'm gonna say? Do not calculate 60% of $42. That does not make sense. Um, if you find this number, I don't know what 60% of 42 is, it's just 42 times 0.6. That is a meaningless number here. Okay, I just want you to know that you will not get any partial credit if you calculate 60% of $42. Um, I, I want you to grow out of that bad habit right, of calculating the percentage of the reference number, which is incorrect, right? So this time, $42 is uh, the price after 60% of the regular price was knocked off, right? So what is that? $42 is, if it's 60% off, you basically paid 40% of the regular price. And 40% of the regular price turns out to be $42. The question here is 42%, uh, sorry, $42 is what percent? Sorry, no, $42 is 40% of what? Okay, that is a question of what? So you're looking for the reference number. Um, the way to find the reference number is to divide that part, $42, by the percentage written in the decimal form, which is 0.4, right? So it's 42 divided by 0.4, and it turns out to be 105. 
$105 is what the regular price was. Now you can check your answer, okay? So try to say for uh, 105, and take your calculator, okay? And you can multiply, you, you can do this on your own. Uh, and of course you are allowed to use your calculator throughout the, uh, throughout the course and even on your exams. Make sure you have your calculator ready. For this one, I don't think, for this test one, you don't think, I don't think you need a graphing calculator or even scientific ones but uh, 105 and um, uh, so take a 60, take 60, <laughs> 105, uh, multiply that by 0.6, okay? And that's $63. So if you take $63 off, you get 42. That's exactly the um, sale price, right? And so this part is used just to check your answer, right? And it's always a great idea to check your answer in your math, on your math exams. Okay, number 14, suppose the number of flu patients is increased by 8% to 4,320 this week. How many patients were there before the increase? Again, do not calculate 4, 000, uh, 8% of 4,220, if you, 4,320. If you do that, you are not going to get any credit, okay? Uh, the, the, again, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that this 8% is not 8% of 4,320. 8% of some number added to that original number is 4,320. So what we are saying is 4,320 is 108% of what number, right? That's a question because um, after 8% increase, you're talking about 108% of the original number. And so uh, you again, looking for the base number and the way you find that reference number is to take that, um, the whole number divided by the percentage, 108% written as a decimal number, that's 1.08. So if you divide it by 1.08, you get 4,000, okay? Now, again, take 4,000, find 8% of it, and that you will see that 8% of 4,000 is 320. You add 320 to 4,000, and you will get this number. That's a way to check your answer. Okay, number 15. Your restaurant bill was $56, okay? If 15% is considered a minimum uh, tip percentage, which some people still do. I think most people give more now. How much um, tip should, uh, should I leave? So this is a straightforward question. 15% of 56 is what, right? So 56 times 0.15. And that's pretty much all you have to do. Um, and uh, so if you do that, you get 840 and that's the amount of tip you should leave, 840. Or you can think of this as, you know, half, of, well, what's 10% of 56? It's 5.6 or $5.60. And then you uh, add another half of that, and that will, you will get um, $8.40 uh, regardless. Okay, so this is a, you know, straightforward multiplication problem. Number 16, suppose that uh, the fatality rate of coronavirus is 2.7%, which is the deaths among all the patients infected. Okay, the, uh, all this is claiming or supposing is that if you have 100 uh, coronavirus patients, then 2.7 of them uh, would uh, pass away. If 1,215 patients have died of the coronavirus, how many patients are infected, all right? So you're saying 1,215 is 2.7% of what, right? Again, of what is the question mark? And so, um, and, and by the way, you notice here in every percentage question, I am converting what is written into, you know, sort of English, right? But um, the question using the word of, because um, you have to use the word of in order to describe any percentage. And if the question is asking for the number after the word of, that is the reference number. And when you are looking for the reference number, you always do a division, division of the number by the percentage written 
as a decimal number. So 2.7% is 0 0.027. And if you do this division, if you carry out this division, you'll find it's 45,000. And so the answer is 45,000 people are infected. And again, you can uh, check your answer by taking this number and multiply that by 0 0.027. That's 2.7%, and the answer will be 1,215. Okay, just a few more questions here. Number 17, a real estate investor, real estate investor uh, bought a building for $2 million. He sold it for three and a half million. After 10 years, he bought it back for 7 million. Then he sold it for 10 million. How much did he make in these two transactions altogether? If you think you're confused, uh, you can start with a certain number of dollars what would be a good number of dollars? Let's start with 10 million, okay? If you started with 10 million and uh, this investor bought this building for 2 million, so now the investor has $8 million and this building. Now he sold it for 3.5 million, so you add 3.5 million to 8 million, that's 11 and a half million. And this is how much the uh, investor has at this point after he sold the building. So he, had, or he or she has 11 and a half million dollars and no building. After 10 years, oh, it says he, he brought it, uh, bought it back for 7 million. So now he has spent 7 million of these, that's 4.5 million left in the uh, bank. And then he um, sold it back for 10 million. So that becomes 14 and a half million. Okay, so what happened? Well, 10 million became 14 and a half million. The answer is $4.5 million. And so that would be the answer to the question. Obviously, you know, some of you may have thought of this, um, a much a easier way to solve this. And that is, first time he made $1.5 million in the, uh, you know, buying and selling. Second time, buying for 7 million, selling for 10 million, that's $3 million. You add them up, it's four and a half million. So that's okay too. Um, but you know, if uh, this is confusing, like buying the story about a lady buying a horse, then you can start with a certain number and then you can compare what you end up with. All right, number 18, suppose there are $5 million $1 bills um, <clears throat> and that you count $1 bill per second. How many days would it take to count the bill? Let's start with 5 million. If you divide it by 60 seconds, that's going to tell you how many minutes it would take you to do that. So let's divide by 60 again. This will take you how many, uh, this will tell you how many hours it would uh, take you to count $5 million. It's still going to be a big number. So then you divide by 24, this will tell you how many days, which is the question. So the answer is going to be 5 million divided by the quantity 60 times 60 times um, 24, okay? And if you do that, it'll be 57.87, okay? So you can just round this to about, you can say the answer is about 58 days, or you can say 57.87 um, days, that would be acceptable. Okay? You can also say about eight, uh, 58 days. Okay, number 19, given that one mile is 1.6 kilometers, how many miles is 4 point, uh, 42 kilometers? So you can set up a, a proportion if you have to think. And some of you may just be able to do this mentally. Uh, 42 kilometers uh, over what <coughs> miles is equal to, remember, 1.6 kilometers to one mile. So the answer is going to be this times this divided by that. So uh, 42 times one divided by 1.6, and that's gonna give you the answer of uh, 26.25 miles. And so it turns out the answer is going to be just 42 divided by 1.6, and that will give you the answer. All right, number uh, 20, find uh, what number is each? 10 to the third is one followed by what? three zeros, right? So this is called a thousand or 1,000. 10 to the eighth, right? So what you should know is 10 to the sixth is a million. 
And so you have two more zeros, that's 100 million, right? So in English, it's called 100 million. Now this one here, uh, remember 10 to the six, and maybe you should say 10 to the six is a million, 10 to the ninth is a billion. And what's the next one? You add three to it, the exponent and that's 10 to the 12th. And that's exactly what you're asking. What's thousand times a billion? Uh, that's called one trillion, right? So it's one trillion. That's the answer to that question. Make sure you know how to read these large numbers. Number 21, you found a receipt for lasagna. It says you need 130 grams of cheese for four people. If you are preparing for 13 people, then how many grams do you need? Okay, now you can sort of guess, and that's about three times, a little more than three times. So the answer is probably just a little more than three times 130 grams. That's like 400. You can keep that in mind as you do your calculation because that is an important estimate, right? The answer here, uh, you do multiplication 130 times 13, that's equal to four times the answer you need, right? Cross multiplication. So you have to divide it by four. And if you do this calculation, basically it's 130 times 13 divided by four, you will get 422.5. So about, you can say about 423 grams or 422 and a half grams. Okay, and so that would be the answer. I know I didn't write this very well here on the corner. So let's just say this is, Yep. what's going on here? Uh, so 130 times 13 divided by four, that's about 420, well, that is 422.5 grams. You think you'll have to solve problems like this in your life? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, proportion problems are the kind that you will encounter many, many times. Okay, and here's a classic example, right? Because recipes don't have just a certain number. I mean, it will always have a certain number of people and your number of people may be different from theirs. So you have to make some um, changes. All right, number 22, the, the area, the state of Texas is 268,600 square miles. That's a huge state, as you know, which has about 7.5 trillion square feet. Uh, 7.5 7 trillion square feet is equal to 7,500 times billion square feet. If this area is evenly split among every person living in the world, how many square feet would everybody get? What kind of question? Okay, well, this is actually a pretty important question if you start thinking about uh, ecology and you know the environmental effects and so on, uh, because people do compare large number of uh, people with a large uh, 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 area, okay? So let's try to figure this out. You have seven, 0.5 trillion. Let's go ahead and write this as 7,500 um, billion square miles. Is that, how should I write this? Should I just write this as billion square miles? Yeah, so it's billion, right? And then you divide by 7.5 billion. Notice here, billion and billion cancel, right? That's really nice because you don't have to have, find a bunch of zeros. Okay. If both are the top and bottom are in the billions, you can just cancel it. And so the answer is really simple. It's 7,500 divided by 7.8, okay, because they're both followed by billions. And that's 961.5 square feet. So according to these numbers, even if you put the entire population of the world in the state of Texas, everybody on average will have um, close to a thousand square feet. And of course that tells you something, right? I mean, depending on what your narrative is, what you're trying to convince somebody of, uh, you can use these numbers. Okay, number 23, a cheeseburger costs 300, and, uh, no, not 300, $3.49. And hamburger costs $2.99. The hamburger is cheaper than the cheeseburger by what number? What, well, the answer is 50 cents, but by what percent? Now, what's important here is, you know, the identification of the reference. What is the reference in this case? The hamburger is cheaper than the cheeseburger. So what you have to do is to find the absolute difference 
which is 0.5 or 50 cents. And you have to divide, okay? You have to divide it by the reference number, which in this case is the price of the cheeseburger, which is 3.49, okay? It's important to know that's the number you have to divide by. And the answer is uh, about 0.143 uh, two and so on. So that's about 14.3%. Yeah, you can say then that the hamburger is cheaper by 14, the hamburger is 14.3% cheaper than the cheeseburger. Get that? Now, the trick, tricky thing is you cannot use this number uh, in the reverse way. You cannot say that the cheeseburger is 14.3% more expensive than the hamburger. The number will be bigger than this because in that situation or in that um, comparison, the uh, price of the hamburger would be the reference number, okay? When you say that the cheeseburger is blank percent more expensive than hamburger. So be careful um, to know what the reference number is. Number 24, last, second to the last question. The pizza shop has 14 inch um, small pizza and 18 inch medium pizzas. The medium pizza is larger than the small pizza by what percent? Okay, so what you have to do is this, find out the proportion, the ratio of 18 to 14, okay? And that's gonna be bigger than uh, one, of course, right? And so that is the, um, the ratio of the large pizza to small pizza in terms of dimension. But because this is a two-dimensional object, the pizza is two-dimensional, you square this, okay? And so if you square this, you get 1.653, all right, so that means in terms of the area, this area is 1.653 of this area. In other words, if you think of the uh, area, the circular area of the small pizza as one, this is 1.653. So this is 65.3% larger. Okay, so what am I saying? I'm saying that the medium pizza is 65.3% larger than the small pizza, even though this is only four inches longer in diameter. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that you need to understand. Finally, number 25, suppose that the Bitcoin lost 20% of its value in a given week, but then bounced back by 20%. Um, it does not go back to the original value, folks. Okay, this is another very important point. If you say it's the same uh, as you started because 20% down, followed by 20% up is going back to the same number. Okay, if you wrote that, you will not get full credit. In fact, you will not even get partial credit because this is a very common mistake. I want everybody to avoid. All right, so what is that? Let's start with um, some number here. Let's say one day the Bitcoin uh, is worth $100 after the 20% loss, that's $20 loss, then you get, and that's worth $80. dollars. Uh, $80. But now you're gonna to have to add 20%. And what is 20% of $80? That's 16%, okay? So you add 16% to 80, and the answer is $96. So from 100 to 96, that's a loss, right? So it's a loss of $4, and $4 out of 100 is of course 4%. So if you lost a value by 20%, followed by a 20% gain, it turns out um, you have actually lost 4% of uh, your value. Okay, so I hope this is making sense. Um, make, make sure you know how to do these problems. And uh, if you don't, you can always um, contact me and I will be happy to help you out and uh, make sure uh, in addition to this video, you uh, look at the answer key so that you know how to answer these questions. And by the way, the work that I've written here, this is the type of work I want you to show on your show your work you know, assignment. In other words, many of them, like the Venn diagram, many of them do require you to do some calculations. So try to write these things down, not for true false questions or matching questions, but for free response questions, you will need to show this kind of work after your test, okay? All right. So. I hope you have a great day and uh, I hope you will do well on chapter on uh, test number one. Okay, see you later.